Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Land Richard. And on behalf of the Coalition to Stop CO2 Pipelines, I want to welcome you to our webinar on CO2 pipeline safety. Uh, this is the second of what is likely to be an ongoing series of webinars meant to, especially for those who are concerned or interested in the Navigator CO2 pipeline that's uh, proposed across central Illinois. Uh, our next webinar will be held in one week on Monday, May 2nd at 7 p.m. when we'll be talking about how landowners can organize to intervene in the project's approval process before, before the Illinois Commerce Commission. Uh, you can go to our website, the coalition's website, noillinoisco2pipelines.org to register. So we hope you do that. Uh, for tonight's webinar, we ask that uh, if you have questions that you uh, go to the bottom of your screen on the right side, you see a, a Q and A button. And if you would enter your question, you can do that as we make our presentation. At the end of the informational portion of the webinar, we'll go through each one and, and give you an opportunity to ask your question and we'll do our best to provide you with, with an answer. Um, so some quick background on who we are and why we're here. I am an ecologist and, and co-director of the Ecojustice Collaborative in Champaign, Illinois. EJC is a nonprofit environmental advocacy group working to educate and amplify the voice of the public in environmental policy and decision making. I'm joined tonight by Pam Richard, a land use and environmental planner, also co-director of EJC, and by Mr. Richard Stuckey, a member of SOIL, Save Our Illinois Land. Uh, SOIL is a nonprofit coalition of community members and landowners across the state that are concerned about the impact of pipeline infrastructure in Illinois. Uh, our organizations are part of a growing coalition of landowners, residents, and organizations unified in the desire to stop CO2 pipelines. Um, we believe that pipelines are part of a costly and inefficient approach to address climate change, uh, that they take away property rights, they damage farmland, they have long-term safety and liability issues uh, that have been understated by the pipeline proponents. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tonight's webinar is actually based on a presentation that the three of us made to the Christian County Board on April 19th, uh, just, uh, just uh, about a week ago. So Christian County, Illinois is, is a significant, um, because it's not only location of, proposed, of the proposed pipeline corridor, but it's also the terminus of the 1300 mile pipeline where uh, eventually the proponents of the pipeline project hope to uh, inject hundreds of millions of tons of carbon dioxide underground. So uh, while there are many reasons why Christian County residents as well as others along the pipeline should be concerned, uh, tonight we're going to talk about safety an issue that pipeline uh, developers might like to avoid. Navigator CO2 Ventures is a limited liability corporation from Houston, Texas, um, who alongside uh, Tenasca Energy and their financial partners are proposing to construct a 1300 mile pipeline uh, that each year would transport up to 15 million tons of high pressure CO2 from ethanol and fertilizer plants in the five state area. Uh, the plan to inject all of this underground in five deep wells, uh, is, uh, the plan is to, to do that uh, north of Taylorville. Uh, relative, relatively few CO2 pipelines have been constructed in the US. Uh, the track record for assessing their long-term impacts and operational safety is therefore very short. And while we've been told uh, that the geology under East Central Illinois is ideal for permanently storing massive amounts of CO2 underground, the track record for that also is very short. What we do know is that there are many impacts to consider and safety is of primary concern. Short term, uh, the pipeline developers and their affiliates are poised to tap into a flood of money. 
uh, via federal tax credits and if, if they can complete the construction quickly. Uh, an abundance of money for them, for a few, but long-term it's the people of Central Illinois who will bear most of the cost and liability. Land taken through eminent domain, soils and drainage damaged by construction, the cost of being prepared for emergency services in the event of a pipeline leak. Um, so what happens after years of injecting millions of tons of high pressure CO2 into Christian County? Will it stay in the ground? Who will bear the liability if something goes wrong? Carbon capture is really expensive. It's impactful and highly technical process, one that carries long-term responsibilities. So our, our message tonight is simple. Uh, whether you ultimately accept or oppose this project, uh, you need to take the time to be fully informed. Uh, take the time to be fully prepared. And, and don't just take our word for it or the word of those who have the financial incentives to proceed. Uh, the decisions we all make and the actions we take will live long after N Navigator and Tenasca and all of their investors are gone. So now I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Stuckey. He is going to begin our discussion of the pipeline safety by talking about the, the nature of CO2 pipelines and how they differ from oil and gas lines. But before we do that, we want to take you to a website, and it is the, uh, the website of DNV. Uh, DNV is a, um, a corporation uh, in Norway. They do, uh, they're a recognized industrial testing and risk, risk management company. And uh, you can go to this website yourself. Uh, you can uh, take a look at the, the, the bit.ly uh, shortened link there, bit.ly backslash CO2 leak. Or uh, if you don't have, have, have time to write that down or don't remember, you can just Google DNV CO2 leak and you'll probably see the video come up. So uh, one of the messages that's frequently conveyed by the uh, CO2 pipeline company is that CO2 is all around us. It's nothing more than the air we breathe out as, as animals, and it's the air that plants use to grow. And in, in fact, I, I find this really interesting, but the Navigator fact sheet uh, says, I, I quote, CO2 is the same thing that puts the fizz in your soda. So the clear message is, don't worry, this project is very benign. Uh, I think we'll let you decide that. This video shows an independent test of a, a rupture of an eight inch pipe buried dense phase carbon dioxide pipeline. It's actually smaller than the version of the pipeline that will pass within one mile of over 50 residences in Christian County and, and uh, through by many residences in the 13 county area that this pipeline impacts. So let's go to the video. Good evening, uh, I'm Rick Stuckey. Um, I wanna give you just a brief 50,000 foot overview of the, uh, some of the technology aspects of uh, carbon capture and sequestration and some of the safety impacts. Um, you've heard the name, uh, you've heard the word rather supercritical mentioned several times. And um, that is a rather unique form of, of a gas or liquid uh, that is used to pump CO2 around. Um, it's the most efficient way of moving it. It acts like a liquid in many respects and like a gas in other respects. Um, it, is, uh, it has to be pressurized to a very high pressure there. That 100, 100 bar, bar, bar bars at the left-hand side corresponds to around about um, 1,072 pounds per square inch. That little tiny yellow square in the middle there, rectangle, is basically the area that shows you the characteristics of the gas that um, is being pumped through these pipelines. So that upper part of that yellow box is 2,400 pounds per square inch. That's not enormous. I mean, some of your pressure washers are like that, but it's high. It's much higher than is used in natural gas or oil pipelines. 
they say it has the characteristics of a fluid and a gas up there. It's a gas in the sense it diffuses, it spreads out uh, very quickly uh, if it's allowed to do that. Wherever it can be spreading, it has low viscosity, it means it flows easily, so it can get into nooks and crannies and so on. And um, it uh, has lower surface tension, so it can be pumped easily. And uh, it's about the same density as a, as a gallon of water. Um, and it has some characteristics that make it very attractive to the oil industry. It's a super solvent. So um, you put it in, uh, put things in it, and it will dissolve things out of, out of the whatever it is, um, particularly hydrocarbons. If you pump it into a oil well, it's been depleted, it'll very rapidly uh, dissolve the oil out of the rocks that are left and make it flow readily to where it can be pumped out. Um, in addition to being a solvent, it loves things like the um, components of valves that are used typically to turn off natural gas supplies. You have to build special equipment to pump it around. Um, I just mentioned one thing it does as a solvent. Those of you who, um, like I do, drink decaf coffee, there it goes. <laughs> um, we'll, uh, we'll know that uh, the caffeine is dissolved out of the coffee using uh, supercritical CO2 because it's such a good solvent. Um, it's also, it, its behavior changes quite a bit according to very small amounts of pollutants that occur in it. Hydrogen sulfide or sulfur dioxide are some of the other things that are commonly found in exhaust gases of power stations, for example, make it behave quite differently. And we don't fully understand um, why it behaves the way it does because of those pollutants. But one of them we do understand is water. All of the CO2 that comes out of a ethanol fermenter is wet, uh, contains about 3% water. Doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it's enough that you have to remove it. It's a fairly energy intensive process to remove it, but it can be done. Uh, if you don't do that, or if water gets into the pipe for any other reason, um, it forms carbonic acid, which very rapidly corrodes steel pipes. So normal steel pipes are at least vulnerable to being uh, dissolved and uh, damaged by carbon carbonic acid or carbon dioxide in water. Um, and as you can see, this is called the critical point up there, which is where it starts turning into a supercritical liquid at about 31 degrees centigrade. Um, and if you release the pressure, uh, it will immediately turn into a gas, the normal CO2 gas, and its volume will go up increasingly rapidly as the pressure is released. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Now let's look at navigate. So what I just showed you is that a CO2 pipeline or pumping CO2 is really quite different than pumping natural gas or oil. Because if those substances get out of the pipeline, they just stay the same thing. So natural get, the oil, oil coming out of a pipeline is still oil, doesn't change its characteristics at all. Natural gas pumping, uh, leaking out of a pipeline will tend to go up because it's lighter than air and dissipate very rapidly. Uh, but CO2 coming out of a liquid pipeline will change into a gas. And uh, in doing so, it'll become very cold and its volume will increase enormously. And it will spread very rapidly as you saw in that video. Uh, the video was using a small pipeline land said eight inches in diameter. The pipelines that Navigator will use, the main line is 24 inches in diameter. The other big difference is that the distance of pipe in that example was only three miles. The distance in pipe between valves on the Navigator could be as high as 30 miles. What that means is that the volume of gas coming out of a burst Navigator pipe would be 90 times larger than what you saw in that illustration. So uh, that's a big consideration of how far it will spread uh, when it leaks out. The Navigator pipeline 
is larger in diameter than all but one of the existing CO2 pipelines in the country um, at 24 inches. It is also nearly three times longer than the longest existing CO2 pipeline. Most of the existing pipelines, or many of them, um, take CO2 from a constantly available natural source. The blue dots on this diagram show you where it's coming from what we call a dome. That's an underground natural occurrence of carbon dioxide, like in a volcanic area. And it's constant, it's readily available, it stays the same pressure all the time. So it's very easy to put a pipe in it, suck it out and transport it, compress it, transport it. Um, and they typically go from wherever the source is to a single point at a time. In, most, in almost every case except one, that single point consists of a depleted oil well, where they use it for what we call enhanced oil recovery. Now, what that means is that you, you pump this oil down the oil well, it dissolves oil out of the rocks that you couldn't have sucked out otherwise, and makes it possible to uh, extract that oil. And the thing you should understand there is that for every uh, gallon um, of CO2 that goes down that oil well, um, the, the CO2 equivalent there, you will get about three, the, the oil coming out will produce three times as much CO2 as you put in to push it out. And so it is in no way an environmentally sound or safe um, sequestration process. It's just a way for getting money out of largely depleted oil wells from which the oil companies are happy to pay money for the CO2 because they make more money from selling the oil. Now, the other big characteristic that's different is that Navigator will have approximately 20 what we call intermittent sources, sources that go up and down in volume at all times, often unpredictably. Um, they, um, in, in a given ethanol fermenter, there may be as high as a dozen different uh, tanks fermenting CO2 at different times. So the process of managing the operations of a 1300 mile uh, pipeline with 20 or 30 variable uh, sources is really much more complicated. You have to maintain the pressure in that little yellow square you saw on the previous slide. Okay, um, let's go on to the next slide. Okay. This is a picture of a pipeline carrying CO2 that ruptured. And you can see what happened there is it just unzipped over the course of maybe a hundred yards. That pipeline just exploded. It burst all the ground around it. It created shrapnel, pipe shrapnel and uh, earth flying around. Um, it's what they call a running ductile fracture. It's because of the nature of the way that CO2 um, changes in volume as the pressure comes up, as the pressure goes off rather, that the volume increases and it just, it, it also gets very cold, which makes the pipeline very brittle. And therefore the, the crack just explodes up and down the pipeline. As a result, a huge volume of gas escapes in a very short period of time with no warning. So what might be a very tiny, say, a leak in a weld or something like that, one second becomes a hundred yard long, huge gaping hole a couple of seconds later. And uh, so you get no warning about this and uh, it makes it extremely dangerous. And having come out, as you saw in that diagram, the gas being heavier than air and extremely cold, um, then spreads out and tra travels. And where it goes to depends upon the slopes of the hills and things like that, and the direction the wind is going in. But it can go, we know, at least a mile. Uh, we've got some examples that Lang will talk to you about, showing you how, uh, how far the um, uh, gas can spread. And when it does spread, uh, it'll be, it'll, uh, exterminate all living things if it gets enough there. Uh, we'll talk about that a little later on. It's extremely dangerous to be in the 
a plume of a gas explosion. Now, you would think that with all these risks, there will be all sorts of regulations uh, covering these pipelines, but there are virtually none. Um, normally, the a federal government organization called PIMSA, the Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration, is responsible for all uh, pipelines, for the design, the installation, and the operation of these pipelines. And they have detailed, really detailed written standards for oil pipelines and gas pipelines, and no standards for CO2 pipelines. And it was pointed out that they should have some, uh, but they, uh, the oil industry said, oh, please don't write standards because that will slow down the process. We don't want to be t told how to do these things, trust us. So there are no written standards to handle the difference between gas pipelines and CO2 pipelines, natural gas pipelines and CO2 pipelines. So it's, it's really a wild, wild west from a technology standpoint. The sort of things you expect to have from PIMSA would be instructions on the thickness and the type of the steel you're supposed to use, the coating that will prevent it from being corroded by the uh, carbonic acid, the distance between things we call crack arresters. These are things that prevent that running ductile fracture from spreading any further. They're basically bands around the pipeline. And there's all sorts of other things that you would normally expect to be there that just aren't. Um, so next step in the federal government regulation process would normally be FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and they have exclusive control over natural gas pipelines, that is methane pipelines. Uh, no, no methane pipelines get built without FERC's approval. They have, again, strict regulations. Uh, but FERC said, hmm, CO2, not the natural gas. We want nothing to do with it. You know, they, they say that the, the, the legislation that was put together to govern them thought of natural gas as being methane, and since it isn't methane, we won't touch it. So there's no federal regulation on the sort of things you'd expect out of those two agencies. So now we go back to the state, and uh, the state has passed a law back in 2010 that when we didn't understand what was going on, and there were two big projects in Illinois that were going to test carbon sequestration that said that carbon sequestration is absolutely wonderful. We need it. And um, uh, also that it's great for enhanced oil recovery. We need that too. But they left a lot of things out. Um, uh, like, for example, who owns the pores? That's the, that's the space under the ground where we put the CO2. Is it owned by the person who owns the land above it? Normally you get uh, ownership of the land as far as the center of the earth, unless you, for example, have sold off your mineral rights. Uh, there are no regulations for how we do things like amalgamation of pores. What that means is if you are a reluctant landowner and you don't want to have carbon dioxide uh, pointed, uh, piped underneath your ground, but many of your neighbors have given approval for that, you can be forced to take it because the pipelines can't control where it goes once it's down there. And they, they, they need to be free from responsibility. Um, there's nothing in there that says who owns the CO2 when it's down there. There's, there are two conditions. One is when the pipe is still running and pumping CO2 down there. The other one is after the pipe has been shut down and the CO2 is still down there and you hope it stays there. But what happens if it doesn't? Who owns it at that point? And what are the liabilities for damage before and after sequestration? So a lot of things that you expect to be um, set down in law just aren't. Next slide, please. Okay, um, getting to the end. Um, there is an agency called the Pipeline Safety Trust, which has been around for many years and has done a lot of very good work on keeping pipelines safe. And recently they hired um, a gentleman called Rick Cooper Ritz, who I know very well because he worked with me on another project. And he's a very good, excellent pipeline engineer. And he prepared a lengthy report for you, which you can find on the Pipeline Safety Trust website. 
And I'll just cut to the, just to hear the conclusion. And what he said is the country is ill prepared for the increase in CO2 pipeline mileage being driven by federal CCS policy, federal carbon capture and sequestration policy. And um, the federal pipeline regulations need to be quickly changed to rise to this new challenge and assure the public that has confidence in pipeline safety. Well, you know how fast things are moving in Washington these days. So don't count on any regulations coming out of there in a hurry. Um, so there, there are lots of gaps in there. Uh, authorizing the pipeline right now when so much technology is unknown is really a dangerous thing to do. And what we're encouraging people to do, particularly counties and states, is to say, hold up for a while, wait until some of these things are in place. We don't need the pipelines that badly. The companies want to get them because the uh, with the federal money flowing in there, there's such a gold mine for them, particularly if it's coming from ethanol. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Lan now, who'll tell you some more about the health characteristics when an rupture does happen. Thank you, Lan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, on the evening of February 22nd, 2020, a uh, CO2 pipeline ruptured near the small town of Satarshia, Mississippi. Uh, the first call came in to the county's emergency management agency about 7.15 p.m. As people reported uh, a dense fog surrounding the area, they were getting dizzy, difficulty breathing. Uh, some people passed out in their homes. Uh, cars and trucks failed to run because their motors, which were powered by an uh, internal combustion engines uh, couldn't run on without oxygen. Emergency responders had no training uh, um, for such an event. Next slide. It was later reported that uh, heavy rains had caused a soil movement and had stressed the 24 inch CO2 pipeline. It caused it to rupture and release the gas into the, the rural area. Uh, CO2 spread uh, over about a mile. By the time the night was over, uh, over 300 people had been evacuated and 49 hospitalized. Next slide. Carbon dioxide is part of our ambient air, as we all know, uh, but it's just 0.04%. And when it, but when it's released in high concentrations, uh, like from a blowout, uh, as I just mentioned, it spreads over low lying areas in, in high concentrations, becomes a, an asphyxiant. Um, CO2 pipelines have no alarm, uh, no, so the damage can be done very, uh, very quickly without anyone being alerted. Uh, Dr. Ted Shetler of the Science and Environmental Health Network has noted that at 2% CO2 concentrations, uh, human breathing becomes uh, rapid. Uh, at 5%, it becomes very distressed. At 7 to 10% concentration, humans can lose consciousness. And not only humans, but uh, you know, this would apply equally to to livestock, animals, other in the, in the area. Uh, at 10%, uh, it produces convulsions, coma, and, and death within minutes. So it can be very, very dangerous. Uh, clearly not the fizz in your soda. So how, how close is the pipeline to homes in Christian County? And recall, we, we made this presentation to Christian County Board not long ago. Um, the same thing would apply to others within, the, within close proximity. Next slide. We took a, a, a Google Earth slide and plotted yellow point, yellow pins uh, within one mile of the current corridor alignment. That red line is the center line of the corridor as we know it. And there turns out there are over 50 homes within a mile of the, the pipeline corridor. 
Next slide. There are also roughly a dozen or more that lie within 250 yards. So you can see in this slide how very close to residents the pipeline would pass. And again, this is in Christian County. Next slide. Under the current alignment, uh, it would pass within about 1.35 five, five miles from Edinburgh and about four miles from Taylorville. So what are some of the things that a county like Christian County would need? And this would apply for other counties too, in most cases. Next slide. One is an emergency response plan. Um, and it should be based on dispersion modeling. It's technically feasible to do a model of, uh, if you have all the parameters to, to, to when you can determine the likely uh, spread and, and extent of, of uh, a CO2 plume. It certainly depends on a number of factors other than just distance from the pipeline, but things like topography and wind speed, et cetera. But uh, this is really important to be done on a, you know, site-specific basis. So then you know where that area of concern, that safety concern might be. Um, also, a coordinated interagency response plan is, is essential. In the case of Satarsia, uh, the emergency responders didn't even know what they were uh, going into, uh, let alone having it coordinated with other, other uh, emergency services in the area. Uh, alarm systems, if those are possible. Uh, certainly training of emergency medical uh, service personnel, emergency room employees. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, internal combustion engines fail to operate in a with lack of oxygen. So uh, electric vehicles are absolutely essential for to operate in, in uh, an area and be, be prepared for that kind of uh, event. Uh, and of course, uh, everyone, the emergency responders need to be prepared with air supply uh, uh, respirators and uh, be, uh, have all of the equipment they need to, to do that. And, and this is not now part of the plan from uh, the navigator. This is something that communities, uh, counties, uh, all areas need to be, be considering. I'm going to pass this over now to, to Pam. Thank you, Anne. And uh, I will take full responsibility for leaving the R off respirators and fix that El Pronto. I, I noticed that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so now let's, let's move into sequestration. Uh, this is of particular importance for Christian County, who really is gr at ground zero for receiving 15 million tons of, of CO2 in their county each year. So once the CO2 is captured and compressed and transported, oops, it uh, will be injected into wells a uh, mile or so underground. And the expectation is that the CO2 will remain trapped beneath the cap rock and it will begin to dissolve and mineralize. That's the hope, that's the expectation. But Supercritical CO2 can be more buoyant than other liquids present in the pore space. And by that, I mean the underground storage area. That means the CO2 will migrate upwards until it reaches and is trapped by an impermeable layer of cap rock. However, if that cap is fractured, the gas can contaminate aquifers, it can stunt crop growth because of elevated CO2 uh, that reaches the soil. It can be released back into the atmosphere, which kind of negates the whole reason for doing this in the first place. And also, as this slide shows, both active and abandoned wells can be pathways of CO2 leakage. That's probably the most uh, common ways that CO2 does escape from its sequestered area. So this aquifer, we're gonna talk about water for a minute, is the primary source of water for six communities in Christian County, including Taylorville. And concerns over CO2 migrating into aquifers are real 
and they've been studied for decades. When CO2 reacts with water, it does, as Rick said earlier, form carbonic acid. And this can cause heavy metals to leach out of sand and rock, potentially releasing them in concentrations that would pose a health risk. This slide shows a relationship between the five injection wells being proposed and the aquifer. It appears that at least one well and, and maybe two would be located over it. Now this is, this is my attempt at, at transposing uh, the aquifer on the, onto the aerial. I think it's pretty close though, if you can see how the, the, the green corridors match up with, the, with the, uh, the blue footprint there. Now, do I know whether any of these wells would be defective or that a fracture of the cap will go undetected? Well, no, I don't know that, but perhaps, just perhaps because of the risk, citing one and possibly two of these wells over an aquifer that supplies drinking water to so many in Christian County is not the most suitable location for these wells. And here are two examples where methane actually has leaked into wells or aquifers and contaminated groundwater. The first took place in Livingston and LaSalle counties when methane stored by NICOR migrated above the cap rock, and it did that 25 years ago. It's affected 350 wells, and the methane continues to be released to this day. It's not been stopped, damaging farm fields and contaminating drinking water. And similarly, methane stored by people's gas under the Muhammad Aquifer near where I live uh, moved above the cap rock and contaminated drinking water. And now the state of Illinois is trying to find a way to both pay for and connect residences in the impacted gas field to a new water supply. And that ain't easy because this is a sole source uh, EPA designated aquifer and it's sole source because there's not uh, nearby sources of water. So the point of these two examples is that gas was able and did move through undetected fractures of cap rock and it did contaminate the water. And a little bit of a different topic here, wastewater injection associated with fracking has been linked to earthquakes. This slide shows that the number of earthquakes with a magnitude of three or greater in central and eastern US has increased by nearly 40% since about 2010. And the data shows that this increase is primarily attributable to wastewater injection, mostly in Oklahoma, but also in Kansas. And the National Academy of Sciences says, carbon capture and sequestration has an even larger potential to induce earthquakes. And this is because the volume of injected fluids will be larger, take place over longer periods of time and occur under higher pressure. And researchers from Stanford have also expressed concern that induced earthquakes could be large enough to potentially break the seal of a reservoir and release CO2 in volumes large enough to cause harm. Now you may be thinking, well, what, what is that plant up the road? Isn't, isn't ADM doing this already? Well, it's true. ADM is sequestering carbon without incident. Well, they do have earthquakes, but they are at a scale of two or less. And that's because the scale of their project is just 3% of what is being planned by Navigator. And I will also add that the literature that I've looked at is that they are raising concerns still about uh, seismic activity and the, the integrity of the seal. So what do we wanna see happen here? I think Rick said it earlier quite well. Why are we rushing to build these pipelines and sequester CO2 in a way uh, where when so many questions exist? And, and funding for research is actually ongoing. Maybe, just maybe, it's time to slow things down. 
Christian County does not have any codes or ordinances that regulate the transport, monitoring, or public safety associated with either CO2 pipelines or sequestration. And I know those of you from other counties, I'm going to bet you don't have anything that regulates CO2 pipelines either. The state, the state of Illinois, has the responsibility to regulate ownership of core space, decommissioning of pipelines, and to address liabilities for damages. But it's not done it, not yet. The county board, Christian County Board, and all of the county boards along the 1300, excuse me, the uh, the 240-mile corridor in Illinois, uh, need time to work with local units of government and emergency responders to determine how the proposed pipeline, and in this case in Christian County, also the sequestration area, will affect residents, farmers, local businesses, people like you, and then develop the codes and the ordinances and emergency plans. And finally, we're asking Christian County and, and perhaps other counties who would be willing as well to consider going to court and asking the Illinois Commerce Commission for a stay. We're expecting Navigator will be filing its application any day now, the end of the month, beginning of next month. And that begins a very ambitious, fast paced 11 month process. And all of us need time to prepare. So the way to do that is also to go to the Illinois Commerce Commission and say, hold the phone here. We have to take a breather. This is something new. This is something different. This is not oil. This is not gas. And we need the time to figure out what we're going to do about it. And then finally, we're also asking um, landowners and we're asking counties and municipalities to consider intervening with the ICC. And as Land noted earlier, that's the subject of our May 2nd webinar, a week from tonight. And the reason for that is that intervention, that process is the only real way to get your concerns and your objections on the record. We can complain all we want, we can express concern all we want, we can protest all we want, but the only way to get this before the ICC so they take your considerations you know, into, into the record and take them seriously is to intervene. So we're asking you all to consider that as well. And so now you can find us, um, here's our website. Um, I recognize many of the names uh, of people who have registered, uh, who have uh, been on a prior webinar or in communication with us. Our website address, www.noillinoisco2pipelines.org is easy to find, especially if you go there a lot of times, <laughs> go there a couple times a week and it pops right up. And our email address, coalition at, again, noillinoisco2pipelines.org and do reach out to us. Now it's time to hear from you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, Lan, we have questions. Now, this is the, this is the way we're gonna try this the best way we can. Um, and I have two questions from Von Stukert that uh, Von Lan is going to uh, unmute you so you can ask your question and we can have a bit of a dialogue about it. And uh, for those of you who have not yet put questions in the Q&A, if you wanna do that, we'll, we'll uh, respond in the same way. So you have two, two questions. The first one is uh, related to uh, pipelines and ethanol. So do you wanna ask that? Oh, sure. Are you able to hear me okay? We are. We are. All right. All right. Yeah, my first question was, uh, if the pipelines are facilitating farmers involved in ethanol production, are they a good group to approach to join the coalition? So who wants to take that? Rick, Lynn, Rick, um, We've got a lot of feedback from farmers, not only in Illinois, but also in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, and uh, Minnesota, where either this pipeline or another similar pipeline is being planned. And there's been an overwhelming uh, 
lack of enthusiasm to say the very least among the landowners, uh, especially those ones along the route of the Dakota Access Pipeline. And this pipeline, Navigator Pipeline, runs parallel right along the, the easement, as far as we can tell, of the Dakota Access Pipeline. The experience these landowners had with um, Dakota Access was very bad. Um, the process of putting in the pipeline was sloppy and careless. And the, the result of that was that the, the soil was supposed to separate out the topsoil from the uh, poorer soil underneath was not done effectively. Uh, as a result of that, the year crop yields have gone down uh, very considerably and stayed down for five years. And although the pipeline companies say they'll give you compensation for the first couple of years, it's nowhere close to, to what you suffer from having the pipelines in there. So crop damage is a major problem. Second problem is uh, drainage problems. When they put these pipelines in, they, they bring in enormous machines, very heavy caterpillar equipment and so on, to dig the trenches out and to lower the pipeline into the trench. And in the process of doing that, if you have any clay, clay pipes or something like that, the chances are they get, they'll get crushed. And uh, the pipeline company says they will restore them, but the farmers who had that happen to them said it was never the same afterwards. Another big problem is that um, if the pipeline is installed, the pipeline company has a 24 hour day right to come in without any approval and go and do whatever they choose to do along the pipeline. They can walk it, they can bring equipment through and so on um, without your approval. Um, and depending on what happens in the way of uh, setbacks, um, they'll, they'll probably clear a very wide path down the pipeline, not much wider than the 50 yards that they require for the pipeline itself. We are 50 yards, on either, 100 yards on either side sometimes. And if you happen to have a nice set of trees on your land, there was one farm that had um, uh, maples for maple syrup and they took 90 percent of their maples down just to make the pipeline for the uh, uh make the boom for the pipeline so it, it wrecked their, their farming and the one last word is that if you if they do have a setback if the pipeline is put down you can't build another building within the distance of the setback so you know a large part of your land is sterilized from the sort of things you might otherwise want to do Long answer, but I'm sorry, that's the reason mm -hmm. that the, the landowners object to this very strongly. So Vaughn, Vaughn did that, that, that answer your question? Or yeah, I'm just, as I'm listening to that uh, answer, I'm thinking, well, are the farmers aware of this kind of things that has happened to farmland or, or not? A lot of them are. In fact, the, those we, we, we have this quote hotline that we maintain here. If you go to the website and the number on the website comes into our, our, um, our, our office. And a lot of folks who have called have already had experiences with other pipelines and they are, they, many are aware. But I think, I think a lot of folks are not aware and we're still trying to get a, the word out that this pipeline is here. It's it's imminent, it's on its way, it's being followed by a second one, and, uh, and we need to begin uh, to organize in, in earnest to, to, to try to do what we can to stop it. So there you are 500 landowners on the pipeline in Illinois, and we invited every one of them to join us at our last meeting in March, and we've invited them again to join us next week's meeting, and we've got ads running in the newspapers or up and down the pipeline and on radio stations up and down this. So we hope we get an even bigger turnout than the 200 landowners who came to our last meeting. That's good. So you have another question, but I think I'd like to move to Kathleen first and then we'll come back to you. Is yeah. that okay? Yeah, okay. thank you, thank you. Okay, Ms. Campbell, you have a question about a notice you received uh, uh, by, uh, by Navigator. So, uh, um, and an easement on your property. So do you want to ask your question? Sure. Basically, I was blindsided by a notice from Navigator in December uh, that they'd be requesting an easement on our property. We're very close to the pipeline. They want to lay down here by Glenarm. 
uh, but my neighbors uh, that are in the subdivision, we have 55 houses and less than half a mile from the pipeline just in Glen Arm alone, have received no notification. They're unaware of the dangers. And yet if they lay that pipeline and it ruptures, quite frankly, I don't know if, it, I don't think it'd be survivable for us within half a mile. Uh, and also with the 30 mile shutoffs, uh, again, it's, it would be 90 miles stronger than the pipeline de uh, rupture demonstration that you were showing tonight. So shouldn't there be some responsibility for notification of the people that are within that area of imminent harm? Uh, yeah, I think, um, I don't want to keep talking. Uh, Lan, do you want to take this one or do you? Well, well I, I think the answer is obvious. It, uh, it should be, but uh, I'm, I'm not aware that there's any intention to uh, even acknowledge the safety issue, let alone notify folks within a mile of the pipeline. Um, maybe uh, Rick has some knowledge or experience in the past from the well, the, the go to access, but they are required to navigate to notify the landowners on the center of the pipeline or within the, the, the band they can move it in. They've done that, yeah. we think, to the source. They, I think, the limit is only if you if your house is more than 50 yards away from the pipe and you, you know, not right on it, they have no obligation to uh, either keep the pipe away from you or notify you. That's the standard established for natural gas pipelines. And because of the lack of federal regulation that's suitable for CO2 pipelines, they just said apply the same old rules, even though they make no sense whatever in these circumstances. So it's a lack of regulation that has caused them not to notify people. Now, if the counties put in a setback regulation that says, for example, that the pipeline can't be closer than a mile to your house, or mile and a half, or whatever we think is the right answer, we just don't know at the moment. But then, they, then they could also require them to notify you if you are within that range. But that isn't existing at the moment. Now, could the ICC put in that regulation, or is it only the county? I believe the ICC could, but I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not quite sure. Yeah. I, I would agree with that answer, and I'm not an attorney either. <laughs> <laughs> Part of our organizing also would be to uh, raise the voice of the public so that it, it can't be ignored. Uh, you know, there's no, no official process for that, but uh, certainly that's one of the things we're trying to do with what we're doing tonight is make people aware of it. And, and the more people uh, express their displeasure and the need for, you know, safety precautions, the more likely that's going to happen, I think. So, Denise, do you have a question? Because I see that you're you're up at the top of my screen, and I'm not sure. I'm glad you're there. No. Yes. Maybe. Um, I, you know, I do have one quick question um, regarding the ordinance. Can the county do an ordinance to the setback? This is something that's very concerning to me to have 15 homes near the pipeline. Can we have setbacks? And we make them large setbacks to try to maybe divert them to go somewhere else. Yes. Yes, I, 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 I think that, that that is absolutely doable. And one of the things that, that we're going to be recommending is that, that you, uh, you require some uh, dispersion modeling to know how far that setback should be. Uh, that kind of modeling exists and it can help uh, guide the, the the minimum setbacks but yeah and th what that would mean is navigator is going to have to change its route and navigate right. to change its route absolutely can we make them go deeper can we make the buildings better by making them go deeper we well, fading out there Denise but yes we you can I know the county can make them go deeper I think the ICC could particularly in areas they call um, you know, uh, higher risk uh, there are areas like where it goes to go to Glen Arm. If you don't move it out of Glen Arm altogether, then the very least that can be done is to define that as an area of high risk where they'll be required to put in a much thicker pipe than otherwise, put in the valves closer to the sides of the city, and uh, put in some of these crack arresters. Maybe at 10 yards apart, you put a crack arrestor in, which will help reduce the 
rate, it wouldn't, wouldn't solve the problem, but it would make it less of a problem or make it last longer and so on when the leak happens. So there are things that certainly the ICC can do. Some of those things it might be possible for the counties to do. We're not really sure about that yet. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, okay. so I have, have a, a question for Mary, Mary Rawlings. I'm gonna... Yes, my question is, as a landowner, um, I w actually, we're not, in, we're not close to a pipeline, but one of the things that I'm most concerned about is, is that from my understanding, um, there's, unless you just happen, like, I, to stumble upon this pipeline, Many of my neighbors had no idea. They'd been he hearing that Navigator is giving these, um, it's good for the environment kinds of strategies. And, and um, so my concern is, is that if it's my understanding that once it goes to the ICC, it's a pretty fast process. So. 11, 12, 13 months is what we're talking about. It would make more sense to me that the people who are most concerned about it, and I can't imagine anybody seeing this presentation in my, in, in my knowledge that wouldn't be struck by the lack of safety issues there. And if nothing more, that just putting a pause on this is probably the first and most important thing is, is that because I know in our county, there are no zoning, there are no, there's nothing in place that would even be able to structure something that would be um, protective. So it would make sense that the ICC is the place to go to say, this has got to stop long enough to be able to see it so it doesn't get railroaded in. And the other question that I have is, are there no legislators who have taken this up as a cause? <laughs> um, either locally, nationally, like, where are the stakeholders <laughs> politically? Yeah, that, that, that's, yeah, that's a national side. No, I was gonna say that's that's a that's a layered question. <laughs> so we'll well let's take it one at a time. You want to go? You you start, Rick. Well, on a national side, the occupation seems to be somewhere else. In fact, they are pushing like mad to encourage this kind of thing. The whole reason this these pipelines have come out of nowhere in the last you know six months or so is because the passage of the. Uh, bipartisan energy uh, uh, infrastructure bill, which put a price of $50 a ton on any sequestered CO2. And that was so attractive for easy sources like ethanol fermenters that everybody's jumping in as fast as they can to line up the ethanol fermenters and lock them in to contracts so they can get the money from the federal government for that. So the federal government is part of the problem. Um, the on the state side, there, were, there was action 10 years ago to, to get involved with this and they passed a very inadequate bill, I briefly mentioned that um, still exists and really needs to be revised at the very least or completely thrown away and start over again. Last session, a bill was introduced that seemed not to be too bad by uh, Representative Bennett from uh, Champaign area, I believe. And um, he, he addressed a number of the problems with some workable answers. The bill didn't get anywhere. Uh, this last session that just finished, um, the, uh, a bill was introduced, we suspect with strong pushing from Navigator that took a completely different approach to solving a few of the problems. It only really addressed the ownership of pores issue and the uh, solution they came up with was to say, we'll treat these underground pores just like you treat underground coal mines where you can separate the ownership from the landowner, from the surface landowner and sell it to somebody else. You could sell it to the pipeline company, for example, or the sequestration company. 
Um, that didn't pass either. So we're left with a vacuum. So although there's certainly some attention to this in Springfield, there's nowhere near enough. And they don't seem to have addressed the magnitude of the problem that's facing us. No, and I, I, would, I would maybe take a bit more, um, uh, maybe a, I, I'm just, this is my personal, personal observations. Let me just say this. First of all, the 2011 uh, act that, that is governing how the permitting process happens for the, the approval process happens rather for, uh, for, for Navigator uh, was written uh, because Illinois is a coal state and it was thought at the time that we could burn coal and capture CO2 and put it in the ground. And wouldn't that be wonderful? We could continue to burn our fossil fuels and, and quote, solve the climate crisis at the same time. So that, that, is, that is reflective of, of the state we live in that is very much uh, pro coal and remains so in my view. And, uh, and I know there's others on this call or, or we're supposed to be on this call who I think would chime in and agree with that because they've been working really hard uh, on coal related issues. And secondly, this is a crazy thing, but this is silly season, right? So what happened last year in the General Assembly is they, they finished a whole month early because it's election time. And, and you know, the whole, the whole process of uh, trying to get their attention as they are scrambling to get something done in Springfield a month earlier so they could go out and campaign. And I think the same problems are going to exist again, you know, as they prepare for November. It's hard to get anybody's ear at this point in time. But I will assure you that those of us uh, who are part of the coalition uh, are going to be convening a call with other uh, organizations, including the Illinois Environmental Council and Earth Justice, the Sierra Club and others to try to tackle some of this. As Rick said, we had this amendment that we believe was being put forward so that Navigator could in fact deal with that port, core space issue uh, because it, it's not an eminent domain question. Uh, so, so we're going to be looking at that to see what we can do. And that also will mean educating legislators and trying to get sponsors for an amendment that that might make some sense. So that's, that's on the horizon. Uh, but we're, we're trying to do what we can do now to, to tackle the, the here and now and to help folks like, uh, like the, the, the county board and CBA and Christian County uh, deal with what's on their front door. We put more radio ads out and more newspaper ads out in the last week. We never thought we'd do. We'll put even more out in the future to try and get to those people who don't fully understand the magnitude of this problem. So, Vaughn, I haven't forgotten you, but we're going to run down the list here, and then we'll we'll come back to your your question too, if that's okay. So, so Jim Rollins also had had a, a an interesting question, and your question is, Jim. I'm curious what the response was from the Christian County. Was it commissioners or representatives? It was the board, and and I I would I would I would wonder if someone from Christian County, like Venice, who was there that night, might want to answer that. But I will say, from my vantage place point, when we were finished presenting, when it was already late in the hour, uh, what I saw was shock. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, I don't know, Venice, what what what's your what's your point your perspective might have been if you care to answer that? Yes, I will. I, I think the presentation was wonderful. I really believe that explosive video really tells a lot. I, I believe it opened the eyes to a few other county board members that really were not paying as much attention to it. Maybe they really was wasn't sure what was going on. But um, again, we have 16 county board members and I really think it opened their eyes. And again, the presentation was very good. The video was very good. I would love to get more of your webinars out there because the average person in town does not realize what's going on. Mm -hmm. The farmers understand what's going on. The average person living in the community does not know what's going on. And we're doing our best to try to get them to a Facebook site, trying to get some type of knowledge for them. So uh, I just want to thank all three of you for presenting to the county board, and I really hope you do additional webinars. 
And we will, mm -hmm. and this one will be posted on our website tomorrow and it can be shared everywhere. So, and we'll share it, we'll share it with uh, those who are on this call. Uh, so you get it directly from us and, uh, and also to the mailing list that we have. So, uh, so thank you for that. First webinar is, is, is available on the website also. And, uh, you know, as Pam said, the, the webinar we do next Monday night uh, will be recorded. So that's, we, we want to get the word out. And it's, it's, it's a big, uh, big hill to climb at this point. We, and time is running short. So we have a question from Mary. Mary, do you want to ask your question about uh, liability? Hello, can you hear me? We can. We can. Yes, uh, I, I understand that there is a lack of clarity about liability. Uh, and that at some point, whether immediately or 10 years after the sequestration takes place, the liability for the sequestered CO2 flips over from the pipeline company to the state of Illinois. So yeah. that means we, the taxpayers, are financially liable, I guess, if something goes wrong with that sequestration, if there are leaks, if there are uh, any toxicity to the water, or worse, if there is a serious large leak which impacts human beings and livestock. That seems outrageous to me. Why should the Illinois taxpayer bear the liability if Navigator has earned a bunch of money from this operation and then they walk away from it? That doesn't make any sense to me ethically or pragmatically. I agree, and maybe maybe Lana Rick have, has something they want to add to this, but but I just want to add to your comments, which are really good and really important, I think, Mary, is that don't forget that we, the taxpayer, have already funded this magnificent proposal with our tax dollars, right? You know, by the federal tax dollars. So so it's it's absurd. It's absurd, and it is the only uh, climate solution that I can think of that allows uh, fossil fuels to continue business as usual. The whole yeah. thing is crazy and absurd. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I don't know, Rick, Lian, you have something to add? First of all, the, the, the end game of this thing is not to do this for ethanol fermenters. That's a, that's a little side game, very profitable one. But the big, the big prize is if you can make this work for natural gas pipeline, natural gas power stations, or uh, you know, later on where it's really necessary for cement plants and uh, steel works and so on, whether it's a really bad problem that's really hard to solve other than by sequestration. Uh, so the, the, that's the encouragement is to get this off the ground and show that this can work and then, then we'll get more and more money poured into doing the hard jobs. So uh, there's a lot, a lot, this whole thing is would not happen if it were not for the government money that's being just thrown into it in vast quantities. You know, there are other situations where, uh, well, let's just deal with one other issue, two other issues. First of all, what happens to this pipeline when, when for example, uh, are there are enough electric cars out there that the ethanol business is not as good as it was and some of the ethanol fermenters go away? Who pays to remove the pipeline? At that point, because if it's empty, it'll float up in the ground and cause all sorts of more problems. Um, so there's liability issues there on the pipeline that aren't being addressed. Um, the uh, the problem with the who who has pays for this thing is that suppose you said, well, the pipeline company has got to be good, got to be uh, responsible for any damages that happen for the next hundred years, let's say. They'll just go bankrupt as soon as they finish the pipeline and got, stop getting the money, as they have no incentive to stay around and take the liability. They maybe wouldn't even do the project in the first place if they didn't felt they'd be liable for it after it's finished. But right now, the, the idea is that when, as a well is finished, not just the whole process, but each well is finished, they'll cap the well off to the satisfaction of the EPA, 
the Illinois EPA. And once that's done, they walk away from it and they have no more responsibility for anything that happens to it. Even if they find that their capping was bad or the uh, well itself leaks, they off the hook once they've been, this has been turned over to the state. So there are all sorts of problems, but there are no easy solutions to this. I mean, even if you made the pipeline company put money aside while it was making a fortune doing this, so when it finished, there was a trust fund there that could be used to handle at least the dismantlement, if not the actual liability issues, that would be very good, but that doesn't exist. And you can look at other examples like this, for example, the uh, coal fired, uh, uh, coal mines rather, there's a whole system set up to, for the public to pick up the responsibility of coal mines that are closed and the owners have walked away from them. And the same sort of thing happens with oil wells. There's billions of dollars, nowhere near enough billions, in the infrastructure bill to go and cap the millions of oil wells that are around that if we were to do it and pay for it ourselves, it would cost like $290 million, billion, 290 billion to cap the oil wells. But the public is getting to do that because the pipeline and the drilling companies just walked away and left them. So we have the opportunity to prevent that happening again, but there's no easy solution. So, I would, all, I would only add, I, I am convinced that this is just the beginning of the pipeline uh, construction, you know, uh, rush, and that uh, as the government is able to, to pay um, or provide tax incentives of $50 a ton for uh, CO2 for geologic sequestration, they also are able to provide $35 a ton at this point for enhanced oil recovery. And we don't know where it's going to go, but there's there are uh, papers out there, Occidental Petroleum in particular has uh, mentioned an overall Midwest CO2 Express um, and uh, Princeton study uh, last year uh, noted a, a the idea of a adding another 50, 60,000 miles of CO2 pipelines uh, within the country, much of it concentrated within the Midwest. And I am thoroughly convinced that, you know, uh, much of that will be dedicated to enhanced oil recovery where it's possible, uh, which is a, a very odd carbon uh, or climate solution. But it's also, a, you know, a giveaway to the oil and gas industry who are being paid to build out the infrastructure and continue to use fossil fuels. There's a proposal from Princeton for a complete uh, network, very organized sort of uh, cover the whole ground, pick up CO2 from all sorts of places and put it into a 42 inch pipeline, much bigger than this one here and take it down to Texas and the Gulf Coast where it could be used for and probably to the um, uh, Permian Basin where all the oil is down there and be used for enhanced oil recovery. So uh, the, behind this is the great desire of the fossil fuel companies to keep doing business as usual indefinitely, or at least to use the promise that this might happen to allow them to do it for the next 10 years, let's say, until it's proven overall, it just doesn't work very well, particularly for things like the uh, coal-fired and gas-fired power stations. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Lynn. I, I see two more questions, and, and then if there aren't any more, we can we can thank you all uh, and wrap it up. Um, I think, Vaughn, your question might be more related to what we're talking about, so let's take yours first. Uh, and yours has to do with federal incentives. And uh, do you want to ask your, your question, please? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of that's been addressed, but um, is there any efforts on trying to get this uh, federal incentive uh, reversed? You know, uh, some of us believe that what we need is a national campaign uh, that, that ties all the states together who are, are facing this. But boy, that's a hard uh, lift to have when everybody's fighting in their backyards to, to try to make it stop. Uh, and when we've got Congress that is so, um, it's a bipartisan uh, 
initiative to make this happen. And the lobbyists, you know, fossil fuel lobbyists are doing their darndest to get, you know, as much as they can out of this so much that the incentives are, are likely to be raised from $50 a ton to $85 a ton. That's what's being considered now. Uh, so it's more financially lucrative. And then we're at war or not the world is at war. So, uh, so people's attention on this is really hard to get. Uh, but I think that's what we need. And, uh, and maybe, maybe as we all are grappling with our, uh, our pipeline operators finding their applications and trying to find ways to intervene. If we can take a deep breath somewhere along the want line, maybe we can collaborate and try to figure out a strategy that would tackle this at the national level. Because you don't really hear much about it. In fact, I would go so far to say that, that I have folks that know us and our organization fairly well and are saying, uh, Pam, isn't this a climate solution and you're opposing it? Like, what's up? <laughs> what's up with that? <laughs> Tell me more or maybe I'll go talk to somebody else down the hall because I can't understand why you're doing that, right? So so we need. They, there's a lot more that needs to be done in the media. And I know, Mary, you brought that up earlier. Uh, Iowa, who's been doing this for a longer period of time than we have, has gotten a lot of press. And I'm hoping as we as we continue the, the drumbeat here in Illinois, that that our uh, exposure uh, with the media will will likewise increase. So um, so that's all. Yeah, I is, is, is is it possible that leveraging you know the likes of a Sierra Club or something on the issue that seeing how their scope is national, you know, I mean, do they have any activity on it or other larger? You know, environmental organizations. No, there is definitely a move uh, by a couple of major organizations to put together a national movement doing this. Uh, Seal and uh, the Health Network were to getting together and planning. They had a meeting to organize this on a national scale. I haven't heard the results yet, but there is efforts like that. Just to follow up something that Pam said. Not only is there uh, uh, nothing, no, no, by us anyhow, large opposition to this in Washington. On the contrary, as this says, they're going to increase the price probably to 85 a ton. And instead of making it a tax credit, give it in cash. That's when the real floodgates open. Yeah. That's, that'll really make you, because this the way it is now, you've got to make a profit and you can offset that profit with this as a, uh, as a tax credit. But you know how, how tax credits move around and people can sell tax credits to somebody else. So, um, th but if they were to make it a cash payment, uh, there'd be no stopping it. I mean, everyone would be jumping in and trying to do it. All the fossil fuel industry would be. Well, well that makes me think about the environmental per permitting in NEPA and federal dollars. So we'll be on the watch for that. <laughs> so, um, okay. And then we have a, we have a question on, on uh, yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Yeah, I was just saying, anonymous attendee had a question. Have a Facebook page. Isn't it coalition to stop CO2 pipelines unsafe at any price? Uh, where's your Facebook page, essentially? I'm not able to allow, I don't see the name in the attendees, so I'm not able to allow that person to speak. Maybe they don't want to, an anonymous attendee. But um, we do have a Facebook page, do we not, Pam? I think it's we, still. We do. We do a Facebook page. It's about a week or so old, and uh, I, yeah, I, I will, I will. Okay, okay. So everybody here, uh, who has registered, I will send the Facebook post, the video, uh, the link to our website, this video, this vi the video. I mean, the explosion video, and then this, this, this video. Uh, like end of day tomorrow, first thing uh, Wednesday morning. So you'll get that. And it would be great if you would uh, look at what we post on the Facebook page and uh, and then share that. There's this great report from Rick's friend uh, who wrote the uh, the, uh, the 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 the, the report on 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 uh, pipeline safety, CO two pipeline safety. That's on our Facebook page. So there are some good resources there, and I would encourage you all to take a look at that and share from there to your own personal pages and share this video that we, we've done here tonight, this webinar as well. That would be great. 
So and if you have another organization you'd like to hear, you know, if you're part of some group that would like to hear something like this, let us know. We'll try and uh, come and do something custom for you. So with that said, I think we're just a few minutes early. Are there any more questions that yeah. someone would like to ask before we, we close our, our time out with you tonight? Barry has posted a link to a bill uh, that would end all fossil fuel subsidies, including the 45Q tax uh, incentives. So, uh, so I'm not sure whether the rest of the group can see that post. Maybe we can we'll make that, that available. In, we'll make that email. available as well. Yeah, we'll do that too. Yeah. So the last thing I wanna say is come to the May 2nd meeting uh, this is your opportunity to understand uh, a bit better the ICC process and what it means to intervene and how to share costs to do it. So uh, it doesn't mean you have to do decide to intervene on the spot, but unless you understand what that process is, why it's important and how to do it, it ain't going to happen. So, uh, so we will be... Uh, uh, joined by the uh, attorney, uh, Joseph D. Murphy, Murphy, who works out of Champaign here with uh, Meyer Capital. Is that right, Rick? I think I got it right. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and so so it's a, he won't be giving legal advice, but he will be explaining uh, a process and what it means to intervene. And I encourage all of us to, to reconvene, get to know each other a little bit better, <laughs> have more questions under your uh, under your uh, cap to bring about intervention and uh, we'll see you then. And we have, we have one last question. If we want to grab this, oh, this from Mary, Mary Rawlings. Okay. Says, I have a question about the carbon footprint exchange tax credits and if they're related to the movement. Um, oh, okay. This is the idea of people who are producing carbon dioxide um buying credits from other people who have saved um who have managed to find some way of sequestering the carbon dioxide um it's a pretty pretty strange sort of business to say the least for the present moment there are no real controls over it it's spreading pretty pretty fast one of the worst ones uh, one of the major ones is the California low low carbon fuel credit? Uh, you can you can uh, if you're even if you're in Illinois and you're sequestering carbon dioxide and don't do any business in California, through some bizarre manner you can take him a credit which could be up to one hundred and fifty dollars a ton from California for sequestering and sell that to somebody who needs a um, who's a dirty project and needs to have a, uh, make it clean by buying credits. So it needs to be regulated very badly. There's a lot of pretty, you know, um, untrustworthy players in the game. There's some good ones too, but uh, it's so easy to, to um, fool the process at the present moment and think you've got, you're giving a credit for something, but for something never happens. Um, or they'll sell it this year and then do exactly the opposite next year and things like that. So uh, it's not a solution. It's a, just another way of continuing to pollute mm -hmm. and just buying you know, forgiveness for it, but it doesn't work very well. A carbon tax would be an awful lot more effective. But don't, people don't like taxes. Thank you all very much for coming. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. See you next Thank week. You. Right. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.